Uh, thanks for the, the invitation to speak. I'm always happy to talk about our video translation. I've been doing this for a couple of decades. Um, can everybody hear me well? Is it sound okay? Yes, the sound is okay. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, okay, so um, as Lola said, there is a question and answer window there, and I would answer most uh, questions at the end. But I mean, if every, anybody has like, I'll stop every now and then for questions regarding what I just presented. Uh, let me just share my presentation here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll give you uh, an overview uh, first of audiovisual translation in general, and then I'll focus on my field of expertise, which is subtitling. Uh, assuming most people don't know much about it or have never worked or have like in-depth experience in the topic, but um, uh, you know, many people had had marginal experience or a brush with this or that or a request to translate. So uh, I know that people are more and more receiving this type of requests. Uh, it, it had been happening for a while, for at least a decade, that um, it's mu so much more than entertainment, what people usually think about when they think of subtitling and audiovisual translation, you think about films. Um, but, you know, the technical field, the corporate field is huge in this area too. And right now it is exploding, uh, like all types of companies and, and segments and organizations are moving to audiovisual means of communication and required translation. So this is already a huge demand and will certainly continue to increase. Um, so, okay. Um, just to give an, an idea of what we'll cover today. Um, first, I'll talk about the big picture. What, what is the field of audiovisual translation? Uh, the most common oral and written forms of audiovisual translation. And then I'll focus on subtitling, which is really my field of expertise. So I'll mention the main constraints of this type of translation, some a little bit about the style, uh, and uh, some technical concepts like spotting and timing or, or syncing the subtitles to the video and the matter of reading speed. Uh, and I'll mention a brief about a little bit about the work methods uh, commonly used. And then we'll have a time for, for Q&A after though. Um, okay, so let's start with the big picture. Um, Usually I, I every now and then I ask questions about what people know. I don't know exactly how interactive we can be right here. I usually like to hear back from people about their impressions or their ideas before I just talk and talk. Um, I'm not sure if that is uh, very feasible right now, but I mean, maybe you can still, uh, you know, include in the chat room, uh, some comments if you feel like it, uh, it's fine by me. Um, okay, so the big picture, audiovisual translation, what is that field? It's, it's a very big field which includes actually a range of different, sometimes very different types of translation. But uh, generally speaking, uh, it means translation of audiovisual materials. That is, uh, you know, uh, files, uh, that contain videos and sounds or images and sounds, usually videos, but not only videos. Uh, it could be presentations, it could be websites. Uh, localization is, can, is, is often part of the audiovisual translation field as well, like software, games, and all that. So it's not only films uh, and video, but that's the most, it's the, it's, I think is the biggest field of audiovisual translation. Um, and there are several types of translation that can be used, which some are oral and some are written. And the main, one of the important aspects is that the translation is integrated to the material, is not separate from it. So when we translate a text or a book or something like that, it's, it's 
the translation is a thing in itself, right? It's separate from the original. Um, and audiovisual translation is not like that. It's added and combined in some way to the original, but the original audiovisual material remains there. And it is the main thing. Um, so this is one of the things is it doesn't work on its own. Uh, you can see, you can look at a dubbing script and it, you don't really know what's going on. You can't read a dubbing script or a list of subtitles without the sounds and images that are supposed to go along with it, right? It has no autonomy. So when we translate, we're not translating thinking of, okay, I'm creating a new piece here, a new document, a new work, whatever it is. Uh, I am I'm creating something that needs to be integrated in some very specific ways to this type of material so that everything works well together. Um, so that's why one of the main um, points that I, I, I keep making often in, in courses and dealing with clients is that audiovisual translation should not be approached as text translation. Uh, that's important, especially because now that so many companies are looking to translate videos, Zoom sessions, webinars, and virtual meetings and everything, it's very common for people to have a transcription of the video in Word, and they send you a text in Word and say, can you translate that? Um, thinking that that's just, just this thinks that's the best way to do it right you you transcribe a text you translate a text and then somebody will just add that text to the video in some form uh maybe voiceover maybe subtitles or whatever it is and it's not going to work it's not going to work well for a number of reasons it's not text um and so it has to be approached as an audiovisual material. You have to work with the images, with the audio, with the pace, with the body language, with everything that's included in it. Um, so just to give you an example of what I just mentioned, right? This is an example of a dubbing script. Um, take a look at it. So there are lots of different types of, uh, you know, uh, codes and parameters uh, that change from client to client and client to client, but, uh, or different countries. But uh, a dubbing script is supposed to convey everything that the voice talents or actors should do with their voices. So it includes small pauses, it includes sharp breaths, it includes intonation, where to emphasize a word, um, lots of things like that. Um, so there's, you have to write in a special way, right? You have to spell out the numbers. If you have a foreign word, you have to do a phonetic transcription of it. There's lots of important details for the dubbing, the dub recording of your translation to work along with that particular material. Um, and again, it doesn't mean anything to without uh, the video itself. Uh, and it's definitely not simple text translation. It's a very special type of translation that you're supposed to do watching the video. I will go back, I will explain more about dubbing and all the other forms. This is just an example. And here you have sorry, um, an example of a dubbed video is not the same as the script. The script is uh, some soap opera apparently. And this is actually the dubbing, the result of uh, a dubbed film. So I'll just play the clip a little bit. You don't want to die, do you? Of course I don't want to die. Why should I? What about you? Do you want to die? We have to hit them hard. We're not killing anyone. This is politics. Use your heads, my friends. Come on. Camille made Robespierre look ridiculous. Fine. So he's trying to salvage his prestige. Fine. What does he do? He arrests the printer and he shuts him down. It's a provocation. He wants to see what we're going to do, and that's why we're not going to do anything. Stay calm. Calm. You hear? Stay calm. Huh? George. Yes. All right. Oh, so you probably know this film is in French, right? And it was dubbed in English. Um, uh, it has, dubbing has the whole interpretation to go with it as well. 
Um, well, just to make sure we're able to hear the video well, uh, in this, because I can hear it from my end, make sure that you're hearing properly. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so then just to explain a little bit about the most common types of oral forms of audiovisual translation. The one you've just seen is dubbing. So the original audio of the dialogues is replaced by audio in the translated language, which is interpreted by professional actors and with lip sync. So the idea of how you write the dubbing script is to try to make sure that, you know, open vowels or closed, you know, lip consonants match the translation, right? The motion of the faces of the actors and the body language and everything has to match um, in the dub version, right? So the, if they're crying, if they're breathing heavily, whatever it is they do not have to be, has to be scripted as well. Um, another very common type of uh, oral audiovisual translation is voiceover, um, which is often confused with dubbing. Uh, but voiceover, the audio is uh, in the translated language is also a recorder interpreter by professional voice talent without lip sync. And the translated version is added to the original film but the original audio remains there. It's just lowered in volume. So you can still hear, usually you hear the beginning and the end of a segment. You can hear the original language uh, underneath, but then the, the translated one is on top of it. It's most, it's most used in documentaries or nonfiction materials, right? So it's not exactly the same. Uh, there's the idea that the translation is clearly an addition, is not part of the film, whereas in dubbing, a, a good dubbing is supposed to make you feel that those that the film is in your language, that the actors are speaking your language. You don't remember that it's a foreign film, a foreign material. Whereas in voiceover, you do remember it's a foreign material and the translation is on top of it, right? Um, and there's also another type, which is narration. Uh, narration is, is an off-screen uh, voice, right? A, a narration or a recording, uh, which uh, the translation will replace the original. There is no lip sync or any like, anything like that because you don't see anybody talking. It's usually a voice. It's very common in documentaries or in, in presentations, in uh, you know, corporate uh, materials. It's also common to have just a voice speaking or explaining something, whereas the images show something else. Um, and in this case, you don't have to worry about lip sync and this type of thing, but you do have to worry about beginning and end. Uh, the translation has to, the duration has to be the last, the same duration as the original uh, text, right? So, and there's another one which I will not talk about much and I don't really know much and I'm looking forward to the next presentation, which is audio description. Um, this is a form of, of accessibility translation. It's for a visually impaired people. Um, so there is a, an oral description of the actions that are taking place and any relevant visual information while nobody's talking, right? So people who can see, uh, receive, can hear a description of a character is running away, there's a car chasing them or, or whatever it is that's happening uh, that is relevant for them to know for the action. Um, and this is also becoming more and more common. Uh, in all of the, the cases, uh, the, our role as translators is to prepare the script, right? Is to write and translate the, the text, the videos and everything that has to be translated. Uh, and what we deliver is the script, uh, is the text in the appropriate form for that particular type of audiovisual script, uh, of uh, audiovisual translation. There may be time codes, uh, there may be some other types of, you know, information uh, that needs to be conveyed. Um, and uh, we work on that part. We don't do the recording ourselves. Some people, it's also a common 
confusion to think that if I'm a dubbing translator, then I do the voices. It's, it could happen if I also were an actor or a voice talent, and some people are two things, a translator and a voice talent, but there are two completely different roles and completely different professions. You're not supposed to be necessarily a voice talent because you're a translator. So our role as translators is to work on the script, and then maybe you can have a second role uh, as uh, a voice talent, but it's a separate thing. Um, and then sound editing is, a, is you know, a subsequent stage, which is usually provided by the client or a video producer or something like that, which involves recording, involves sound editing, and a lot of our other technical tasks using the text that we prepared. So I had mentioned narration, and this is one example uh, of a narrated video that we, you know, was translated into several languages. So I'll just play and, and then I'll, I'll ask you a question about it. Two thirds of working Ontarians don't have a workplace pension plan. That's a real disadvantage when saving for retirement and a huge gap between what many working Ontarians will have and what they'll need. The Ontario Retirement Pension Plan was created to help shrink the retirement savings gap and create a predictable retirement income. Learn more at Ontario.ca slash ORPP. All right. So my question uh, about this, uh, this was, this is an audiovisual translation and why, why is it? Uh, if we receive the script with the text that is narrated in English and I had to translate it, suppose into Portuguese. Um, you, can, you can answer in the chat if you want. Um, if I had translated the text just as a text and I had not received the video, um, do you think there could be any issues or potential issues is showing from the fact that maybe the client didn't tell me it was a video or didn't know it was a video or didn't care that it was a video and I just translated the text. That's my job, I translate texts. Um, versus if I had worked with the video, what could be a potential issue if, if I had approached this just as a simple text translation? The length of video, the Yeah, so the, the time of the narration, yes, yes, that's where I got Laura. The image of the man, of the man jumping on the bridge because they're talking about the gap and bridging the gap, right? Uh, timing, yes, uh, timing is important always because the exact moment where the narration starts and stops and make a pause, right? There is, there's a matter of important, as an important couple of seconds of silence and things like that. All of that has to be followed. But looking at the images, you can see that the mention of the gap and the bridge is important because the man is actually jumping over a gap on a bridge. Uh, depending on the language you're translating, if you're translating just the text, you could maybe find ver a range of different solutions for bridging the gap, right? Um, where, but if there is a bridge and a gap on the video, you have to actually work with the fact that images are there and the audience, the, the target audience will actually see uh, the bridge and the man jumping over the gap. So in other types of translation, maybe that would not be so important, but in this case, it can make a big difference in, you know, the metaphor and, and all of that, right? So this is just, yes, I can see about the emotional tone, tone of voice. Uh, there's not a lot that we can do about the text, except of course, you can consider how formal it is and things like that. Then the type of emotion and how the voice is conveyed is a, vo is a job for the voice talent. But our job as translators is to, to write a good text that will, in this case, it has to be it has to be comfortable to be read out loud. It cannot create a cacophony. It cannot create a strange pronunciation or difficult pronunciation. Uh, it has to be fluent. 
to, to the ears of the target audience, right? Which can, can be completely different from a fluent text to be read, right? So goals are different and the fact that you have the material in front of you can be critical for a good result, right? Um, and then there are written forms of audiovisual translation. Um, the two most common one, one is subtitling and I'll focus more on it. Um, so it's the written translation of the original dialogues or text in the video are added to the screen in segments of text that is synchronized with the audio. Um, the main thing is that the subtitles have to be concise enough to be read in very few seconds and have to be understood at first sight at the same time that you're watching a film. You're supposed to be looking at the images of the film at the same time as you read, which is quite a complex text for, for viewers. Uh, another very common is a closed captions or is also called subtitle for the deaf and hard of hearing, which is also a form of accessibility uh, translation. Uh, it includes not only what's being spoken, like the oral text of dialogues, but also any relevant sounds. It could be a shotgun or a phone ringing or you know a person sobbing or crying uh, is for people who can't hear that and they have to read that kind of important cues about what's happening in, in the background or things like that right so it's also commonly confused with uh, just a simple subtitling in the same language many clients ask for closed captioning service but they actually mean just regular subtitles in the same language. You often to use in social media or to help people understand what's being said, but it's not technically for the deaf and hard of hearing, which is a different thing. So again, our role is to prepare the subtitle file in a very specific type of file with following sort of criteria. And it, that is later followed by video uh, by post editing, right? It's usually done by, by a video editor who adds the subtitles and configures the, the type of font, the position and everything of the subtitles on the video. So just an example, this uh, is, illustrates what closed close captioning is, right? Which is not regular subtitling. Uh, this is meant to help people who can't hear that R2D2 is beeping cheerily. Uh, whereas regular subtitles would not include that information because you can hear the R2D2 sound, right? Um, and it's relevant because if you don't understand that sound by R2D2, you also don't understand why this other robot, sorry, I'm not great, <laughs> it's <laughs> replying, uh, is giving that particular reply. Um, and this is an example of a subtitled video. Challenge one, push your guys' limits physically. This challenge will push your limits mentally. I'm way out of my element on this one for sure. So the challenge today is to tap into another side of me, I guess. And what I'll be looking for is what's in here, what's in here. All right, so you might notice, uh, I mean, if you understand French, uh, you might notice that one important aspect of subtitling is conciseness, right? Uh, this will kind of lead me to start talking about more about subtitling. Um, French, as well as, you know, Spanish or other Latin languages are commonly, they take more space, they need more wording than English, right? Which is a challenge in subtitle because you have to be concise, you have to read the information quickly enough to actually watch the video. Otherwise, you will just looking at the bottom of the screen and rushing to read and missing out on important information, visual and audio information, right? So the 
type of translation is definitely not literal and uh, not a worthy, complete, complex type of translation. It has a different kind of goal to be conveyed adequately, you know, together with the audiovisual material. So this is more what it looks like, what, what we deliver to the client, what a subtitle file looks like. There are several different types of subtitle files, uh, but they all have the time codes, uh, which are very precise uh, syncing information about each little segment, which is one subtitle. And you have very strict limitations of the number of characters that you can use, right? So this is more what we work on most of the time. Um, so now let's focus a little more. So like I said before, it's a written version of the original dialogues or occasionally text on the screen. They're added to the screen in segments that are synchronized with those audio segments. This is really important. Um, the syncing part, the fact that you have to read at the same time that the person is talking. Why is it so important? Because um, talking and hearing oral information is much faster than reading. We need more time to read than we need to talk. Um, so you are able to hear a huge and understand a huge amount of very fast information orally. Uh, but you need more time to process and understand reading a text, right? If everything that I'm saying here right now at this space that I'm talking, if I had subtitles underneath me transcribing everything that I'm saying and you're trying to read all of that, you probably would not be able to keep up. You can't read everything that I'm saying at the same time. You need to read a slightly shorter version of it to be able to to actually read everything at the same time that I'm speaking. Um, though, so this peculiar aspect of the written forms of audiovisual translation is the original, the source material is oral and the target material is actually written. There's lots of challenges uh, associated with that, right? When we speak, we have pace and intonation and lots of nuance in how the message is conveyed orally, whereas in the text, we have wording and punctuation and lots of things that you have to actually add and create based on your interpretation of what's being said. It's, it's not, a, when I'm speaking right now, I'm not, you don't see any commas or periods. Where did one sentence end? Should I start a new paragraph? What's going on, right? So writing a text is a very different type of code in itself. Um, so like I said, we need more time to process written discourse than oral discourse. Um, you must be able to see the images as well as the subtitles. If there's too much text to read, and the viewer is forced to look at the bottom of the screen and read, 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 focus on reading because it's too much information to process, it's too fast, and you're not able to actually look up and see the action that's going on, the images, the body language, whatever is happening, you will finish that video and not really know what happened. So you need to be able to quickly look down and look up again. There's there's research about you know, eye movement on, on the screen from viewers and people don't read subtitles like this, going like this on the screen. They actually watch a film and their eyes go like up and down, up and down, up and down all the time, like several times per subtitle. And a subtitle will be on the screen for two or three or four seconds usually, right? So when your eyes go up and down trying to match or who's talking, what's happening, what am I reading? And, constantly like that. Um, so you must be able, our brain just blends everything together. It has to be coherent. Everything has to make sense and have to be conveyed at the right pace and just the right amount of information for everything to come together. Uh, also, of course, the pace is dictated by the speed of the dialogue and the scene cuts. We can't change it. It's, the speaker is talking way too fast and the scene cuts are cut like crazy and the subtitles cannot 
you know, move over from one scene to the next and I don't have space for my text. Well, you just have to change your text and make it fit somehow and just remove information that's not as important, see what's the priority, see what the messages convey by themselves and maybe you don't have to repeat it, see what's already been said and it's kind of redundant. So there's a lot of decisions that you have to make uh, when subtitling any type of material. And uh, usually there's just enough, um, just enough time to read the subtitles once, right? So you're watching a film, it could be a class, uh, a, a webinar, it could be a, a fiction film, it could be all sorts of things. Um, usually there's just, just enough text for you to read the subtitle in time and take a look at the images and the subtitle is gone. You have one chance. So if anything is confusing, ambiguous, I don't know, or the sentence is way too long and you forgot what the subject was three uh, subtitles ago. Oh, sorry, it's gone. <laughs> you can't go back. So uh, even if you could go back, it kind of ruins the experience of watching. So this also has implications on the style, right? The style has to be uh, written in a way that is clear to understand at first sight. So the main constraints that we have because of this is first of all, reading speed, right? Um, the convention is no more than 15 to 18 characters per second of the duration of the, the dialogue. Um, this is how, long, how much the subtitle will be on the screen, right? If I say a sentence that lasts three seconds, the subtitle will be on the screen for three seconds, exactly when I begin and end my sentence. Uh, you can use 15 to 18 characters, including spaces and punctuation, which is not a lot. It's usually not enough to convey everything that's being said in those three seconds, unless the person is speaking very, very slowly which is usually not the case. There is also the space on the screen, right? Um, it's usually 30 to 45 characters per line and usually up to two lines of text. That changes depending on the client, on how the client will format the subtitle, the size of the font and things like that. So the client tells us you can use whatever, 36 characters per line. So there's a space limitation as well and as the reading speed limitation. And there's also the style, as I mentioned, it has to be clear enough to be understood at first sight. And it has to be consistent with the images, right? Like in the bridge uh, thing, uh, it has to match what's being said, the, the register, the level of formality of informality, uh, nuance in the wording that you choose has to match the tone, the intention, what's being conveyed by all the nonverbal information that the viewers will have access to as well, right? You might have lots of cases with a pun or a joke or a metaphor being used that you will say, okay, in my language, I have an equivalent metaphor. I will use a, an equivalent image to convey the meaning which is different from that particular image. But if you have that image on the screen in front of you, that's not a lot you can do, right? If somebody mentions the elephant in the room and there's an actual elephant, then, oh, may, in my language, it's not an elephant, it's actually a goat. Oh, there you have to work around what the image is doing to your text. So uh, you have to work with the video all the time. Also, it has to be well distributed on the screen. Um, so this means uh, one of the technical terms that I'm introducing, which is spotting, which is how to break the subtitles. It's also a task that we have, you know, where to break one subtitle from the other and where to break the lines internally also can make a big difference in, in, in the experience of watching the film. And I'll show you an example of it. So um, just to give a, a very, very simple examples of the type of work that we do constantly, right? So suppose this is a sentence and somebody says, because it was raining, we canceled the bike rate. 
Um, I can't use all those characters, it's too much to read in my translation. So I do slight edits in the text and maybe I come up with this. It was raining, so we canceled the bike ride, which is slightly shorter. Uh, I don't lose anything important, but this doesn't fit in one line. I have to break it into lines. So where do I break? Where is a good point to break it into lines? Do you want to give a suggestion? Exactly. Using where the comma is, right? It's usually, usually is where you make a pause or take a breath and it's easier to read information like this. You, you read block of, blocks of information, right? Uh, so you break the sentence there and it's comfortable to read. Uh, so this is a type of work that we do every single subtitle. So for instance, this one, somebody says, it's not such a bad idea to take some time off. Oh, it was too fast. I can't use all of those subtitles. So, oh, sorry, all those characters. Um, so I have to edit the text somehow and make it shorter. What do I do? And I'm probably gonna go a few minutes over my time. There you go, Margaret. That, so there's lots, yeah. It's not a bad idea, eliminate such, exactly or do a more radical thing like Margaret suggested, like it's a good idea to take some time off or taking some time off is a good idea. Uh, there's lots of, of course, it depends on how many characters you would need to save, right? Maybe just a couple or maybe more, then you make a more radical decision. I'm just giving an example, of course. The idea is usually to not try to lose anything important and don't do drastic changes, but sometimes, we, we can't do much. And how about lane break? Suppose this line does not fit the space we have for one line and we have to break it in two. Where would you break it? after time off, that's right. Taking some time off is a good idea, right? Subject predicate, good. And, ju and just uh, one last example. So suppose the person actually says this and it's transcribed like this. The truth is um, I, I need cash, right? If you're writing a dubbing script for dubbing, it could be super important to retain the hmm, the stirring, the hesitation, because the actor will have to do the same. But for subtitling, we kind of clean it up, right? The truth is, I need cash. Why? Because you can look at the person and the person is hesitating and the person is going, mm, uh, uh, uh. doesn't matter what language it is, you get it. You, you can hear it, you can see it, right? You don't need to read a transcription of nonverbal information, which is kind of annoying if you have to constantly read that, it it's just kind of pollutes the text a little bit. So we also clean up the text a little bit for subtitling. Always remembering that the viewer has full access to what's going on, to how the person is acting or, you know, the body language, the extra sounds, the, hmm, that any language you can get what's going on. Um, so I'll give you two quick examples of actual and actual translation. Um, this is from Portuguese. It's a bit of a safety video that was for visitors of a shipyard. So I subtitle a small portion of it, it twice. The first time that you will see um, the spotting, timing and reading speed are not fully adequate, right? So spotting is how the subtitles are segmented, where they start and end, and how the line breaks are done. Um, timing refers to sync, to actually sync with the subtitles against the audio, and reading speed. This translation will convey everything that's being said without, um, without uh, taking care of not exceeding 18 characters per second. So I'll play this one for you. Oh, 
Ao chegar ao estaleiro, identifique-se. Esse procedimento é importante para a sua segurança e é ainda mais importante para que as pessoas reconheçam que você é um visitante. O crachá de identificação será entregue na recepção e deve ser usado na altura do peito durante toda a visita. Em caso de emergência, será acionado o sinal sonoro. Mantenha-se calmo e siga através das rotas de fuga até o ponto de encontro localizado no cais principal do estaleiro. Para início da emergência, você ouvirá um toque contínuo. Ao final da emergência, serão acionados três toques de 5 segundos. Se você presenciar alguma situação incomum, como princípio de incêndios, queda de material, reporte imediatamente ao seu acompanhante ou a qualquer funcionário do estaleiro. O número do ramal de emergência do estaleiro é 5355 e o canal de rádio, o 13. Right, so it's just a a short sample and I didn't do a terribly terribly bad subtitling that was not the idea it's just the sync is a little bit off and the line breaks and subtitle breaks are not in a very comfortable spot uh, and some subtitles are a bit fast right so were you able to follow to read okay usually you can follow if you focus on the subtitles right if you concentrate on reading you are able to follow but then what happens you are not able to take a closer look at the images and the images are super important in this case they illustrate what you're supposed to do right also this is a two minute sample but imagine looking at that for like one hour it becomes exhausting it takes a lot of concentration and it becomes very tiring uh, to do that, uh, you can feel at the end of it, you're like, wow, I'm so tired and you don't really know why. And you also have a risk of just missing some of the information and the image, not understanding everything properly. Right? Um, so there is a second version of the same video where I correct all these issues. Take a look and see if you feel it helps. Ao chegar ao estaleiro, identifique-se. Esse procedimento é importante para a sua segurança e é ainda mais importante para que as pessoas reconheçam que você é um visitante. O crachá de identificação será entregue na recepção e deve ser usado na altura do peito durante toda a visita. Em caso de emergência, será acionado o sinal sonoro. Mantenha-se calmo e siga através das rotas de fuga até o ponto de encontro localizado no cais principal do estaleiro. Para início da emergência, você ouvirá um toque contínuo. Ao final da emergência, serão acionados três toques de 5 segundos. Se você presenciar alguma situação incomum, como princípio de incêndios, queda de material, reporte imediatamente ao seu acompanhante ou a qualquer funcionário do estaleiro. O número do ramal de emergência do estaleiro é 5355 e o canal de rádio, o 13. Were you able to notice any difference? Yeah, it's one of these things that sometimes it's hard to put your finger on exactly what's wrong with the other one and exactly what's better with it, but you can feel it, right? Uh, this text is... is is a lot more edited than the other one. It's less literal. It's changed around the style to make it more concise and more clear and more to the point. Um, and it's the, the segmentation of the subtitles make a huge difference in the speed, in the comfort of reading. And you just feel that you have more time to actually focus on the images and you read at a more unconscious level let's put it this way you don't have to concentrate so much on reading so this this it looks subtle but it requires lots of manual work and shifting your sentence around and paraphrasing and changing it up several times until you say okay i feel that everything fits nicely now so it's lots of, of subtle editing job of the text okay um i'm a little late i'll rush now to finish i'm almost done just a little bit on the most common work methods for subtitling. One is based on what we call a template, a trans transcribed text. So the client actually provides 
uh, a transcripted version of the original dialogues, which is already turned into a subtitle form, right? It's segmented, it's timed, you have the time codes, uh, and it's that file is converted into a Word file, so you can open it on Word and translate it as a text, looking at the video on the side. Um, and you replace the original transcription with the translated text, making sure to take care of the maximum number of characters per line and per duration. So you have to look at the time codes, see how long each subtitle lasts, maybe one second, maybe five seconds to see how many characters you can use and include your translation there, replace the original one, the, the transcription. Uh, and then send the file back to the client. The client will convert this text version back into a specific type of subtitle file to do the post editing and add it to the video. Uh, so this is just one example, right? You receive a file looking like the one on the left and you deliver a file looking like the one on the right. It follows the same segmentation, the same duration, the same uh, time codes, the subtitle will come in and out at the same time, but replacing one text with the other. This is simple in a way that you don't have to use specific subtitling software, you don't have to do technical tasks, uh, but the hard part is you have to follow the segmentation of the original text, which can be challenging in some languages. Um, you can't change it up, right? Start with the end and change up the, the order of the parts of the sentences and things like that. Um, characters in, always include spaces and punctuation, yes. Um, and the other work method is based on just a video file and there is no template. Um, so this requires you to work on a subtitling software and you do usually the task of the spotting of deciding how to break the, the subtitles and the timing, syncing the subtitles with the video and delivering that specific type of subtitle file. So you create that file, which is done in a subtitling software. And there are lots of different types of subtitling software. Just to give two quick examples, there are two very popular ones, which are free, relatively easy to use, um, not intuitive, at first, I, I would suggest, you know, actually training, but um, many people use it because they're free and relatively easy. Uh, one is subtitling workshop. So you actually write the subtitles down there at the bottom. You sync, you add the, the in and out timing information, and you can see how they look on the video. Um, another one is subtitle edit. Uh, I wrote the name wrong, it's subtitle edit, not subtitling edit, um, which is another very popular software, it's also free. So it requires more of a learning curve uh, to be able to actually do all those technical tasks as well, right? Um, so I kind of rushed at the end a little bit, but let me know if you have any questions. There's my contact information. I can, uh, Lola, send you the also the presentation if you actually want to share the presentation as well, anybody. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Carol. This is wonderful. And I'm getting messages, uh, private messages about how beautiful and wonderful your presentation was. We do have around five minutes right now. And uh, for questions, and I'm not sure if you will still be here at noon, Carol, when we are done with Joel. If, if you're still here at the time, then maybe, you know, we can uh, have some questions at, at that moment. So let me go first. Uh, a couple of questions that I spotted on the chat. Mm -hmm. One person asked, when you mention characters, do you include the spaces? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that. Always include spaces and punctuation in the character count. Okay. There is another question, and this is from Hasmok. I'm not really clear. Uh, it says how it was a super job. How how good is the rate? Because it involves different types of skills. Yeah, is it per word or per second. And I have heard this from many freelancers. How do I charge for it? Yeah, it's uh, and I'm I'm just seeing Laura's Molinari's question also right now. So no, it's not per word. Everything involving audiovisual translation in general 
is usually the calculator per minute, per video minute. Uh, in the same way as transcription, uh, which is also a kind of audiovisual translation. Uh, but it, it's usually considering the video minutes. Now, the race can change a lot uh, in face of the, the tasks that you have to do. So if you're working based on a template, so you don't have to use subtitling software, you don't have to do the syncing, the uh, spotting tasks, uh, that's usually a lower rate because the client did the technical parts for you and you have to mostly focus on text translation, on translating the subtitles, uh, it's usually a little lower. Um, when you need software to work, it can be a little higher rate. When it's, uh, technical, corporate, non-fiction materials that require more research, it's, it can charge more. If you have a script and supporting materials to help versus you don't have a script, you have a difficult audio. Um, so it's, it's like the translation industry is far from uh, common established rates. Uh, you have to negotiate depending on, on what, you, what you are able to do and so it's very hard to give specific rates, but I can give you a big, big range. You can go from as low in, especially in the entertainment segment, like streaming videos, like Netflix and all that, you can go from as low as like $4 per minute for translating subtitles, uh, where you don't do the technical task, but you still translate um, you know, all the dialogues to, $15, $20 per minute if it's a more technical task and if you're taking on a more complete uh, work on your part from a technical point of view. Uh, and personally, I usually, I always make a quote based on what I see on what, what kind of project I receive, what I'm supposed to do. And I estimate, you know, how long is going to take me? Do I need a revisor to work with me? Who is doing the technical part? Who is syncing the subtitles? So depending on what is required, then I will give my quote, but the range vary tremendously. Uh, I would say the most common ones are more like between five, six dollars per video minute. If it's not too technical, if you don't need to use software, to $10, $12 per minute if you're doing a more technical task and you, you need to have more skills to do it. Thank you, Carol. And, and with that, you also answered Laura's uh, question. We have a couple of questions about further training. So people are asking, where can they get more training or develop the skills, the, the subtitle skill? So, well, I do, I offer training. So that's one of the things I've been doing for uh, more than a decade. So I do have online courses going on. Um, other than that, it's very hard to find anything that it's not easy to find, I have to say, uh, training in uh, audiovisual translation. You have some online options in universities uh, that you can take from f at a distance. So that's relatively easy, but some of them offer like MA courses, full, uh, you know, like full courses. Um, so I really don't know many others, I have to say. Well, the, the one thing that I teach is subtitling specifically. So that's what I've been doing since my MA in the mid nineties is teaching subtitling. So and, re and related to that and gaining the skills, uh, we have here Natalia asking any suggestion to practice as a volunteer translator or, or a very common question, Carol, is how do I get into the sector? How do I add yeah. that to my portfolio as a freelance translator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, there's, there's lots of options volunteering. Lots of people ask or, or try to do translation for like TED Talks and this kind of things because they have an online platform. You can volunteer. It's a good, it's a great way to try your hand at it. Um, the, the only negative aspect of that is you're not going to have the quality control at the end. You're not going to have the client at the end doing a strict revision and saying, you know, this is not, uh, there are some flaws or some problems here and giving you feedback. So you don't get that part. You get the part where you try to do and you do the best you can, but you don't receive the feedback. Um, that's the only difficult part of doing volunteering translations, but of course you can, you can go to TED Talks or Amara. Amara, it's a website that does like community based uh, translations and you can try your hand at subtitling. Um, I would say really look for courses on 
dubbing or subtitling or formal courses because it's it's a very very technical uh, skill you might be attracted to translating dialogues and the challenge of the conciseness but it's actually a lot about developing a skill to work on a software and, and achieving precise syncing and all of that it's it takes a lot of time to get that you you do have fun suburbs uh doing you know uh subtitling lots of series for fans and like you know uh putting the subtitles on the web and everything everybody thinks that's great and fun i have i had lots of students who could do amazing syncing and amazing subtitling and super fast but from the language point of view the style the grammar was not what a client would expect a professional client would expect so then again you need the feedback of what a professional uh, industry would expect from uh, a subtitler it's a mix of uh, sometimes a creative literary translator with a very technical skill involved um so uh i think i could if you if anybody wants to email me i could try to give some suggestions of of courses other than what i am able to teach which is only subtitling is not a lot but other things uh, there are other universities in europe there are quite a few universities offering courses in audiovisual translation and how to enter the uh, the translation how to add that to your market um to me is one extra skill of a translator. I don't do only this, I translate, you know, text as well. But more and more you have clients that, that need all of these things, that need a text and a presentation and a website and a video. So you literally, you just add the skill to the skills that you already have, right? So you can be a technical translator or a literary translator and also get into audiovisual. Sometimes it's, it's the same clients that you already have that will need um, subtitling or audiovisual services. Or sometimes you can start move to, towards the entertainment sector. You know, the video producers, the streaming services, they need a lot of translators. They usually don't pay a lot, but they're entry level, good entry level for this kind of industry because they are always needing people. Um, you learn a lot by doing it. You get training, you get practice, you get to start working quickly. So you, you just pick up on a lot of skills. Maybe you don't earn as much, but you learn a lot and you, then you can move on from there. So it's also good, good for entry level uh, into the entertainment sector. Thank you so much, Carol.